Spring is bursting forth out here at the Garden Home Retreat, and we're going to take a look at beauties like these and much more right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now today, we have an exciting show for you because in my garden, the tulips are blooming. Yes, we're out here in the middle of the vegetable garden, but you know, I like to mix it up. We've got flowers and herbs and vegetables and all sorts of things going on here. We'll get to that a little later in the show. Now we'll also take a closer look at some of the important elements to our rainwater harvesting system. And I want to show you how I'm using strawberries down in the vegetable garden. And you won't want to miss seeing these beautiful migratory birds. Now over the past several weeks out here at the Garden Home Retreat, the daffodils have been absolutely spectacular. They have really stolen the show. But as they begin to fade, our early, mid, and lates have already finished up. We've got a few lates still blooming. The tulips now are taking center stage. And just look at them. This is one of my favorite varieties. This one's called Negrita, and I just love its rich purple color. And I've planted it here among nemesias and violas and pansies along this flower border out here in the vegetable garden. You know, I could just sit and look at these gorgeous blooms all day long. If you know me, you know I love this cool color range. But you may be a person who prefers some of those warmer, sassier colors. Well, we've got some tulips to show you there as well. Right over here. Come on, let's take a look. See, I think Angel likes these warm colors as well. Just look at these tulips. Aren't they fantastic? This is one of my all-time favorites. It's a variety called Perestroika. Just look at the colors in that gorgeous thing. Now what I've done here is I've mixed it in with lots of other cool weather annuals. You'll see, of course, pansies and violas, but some other interesting things as well, like this gorgeous little diasica. It has a great sort of coral color. And then I've also planted some osteosperma. It has a beautiful yellow color to it and blooms for a long time. So you see, I'm not just using ordinary cool weather annuals. We've got a lot of other things going on here as well. And even one perennial. We've got a gallardia in here called lemons and oranges. So it picks up this warm color theme quite beautifully. What I love about this tulip is it makes gorgeous table decorations. And if you ever throw an early spring party, these tulips will knock people's eyes out. I love using them in chandeliers, even in big bowls along the center of a table. They're just so bright and festive. There's no better way to get into the spirit of spring. You know, about the time my tulips really start showing a lot of color and begin to fade off, I get the urge to get out and start planting herbs. They're an important part of this garden. I not only plant them in raised beds, as you can see here, but I also love to grow them in containers. This time of year, I start with plants that can take cooler temperatures, like thyme, uh, certainly this parsley, dill, and these chives. Now plants like basil, well, they like it really hot, so it's going to be another full month before I plant those and begin to venture out too far with my tomato plants. Now what I like to do is take three or four plants and fill into these 18 to 24 inch clay pots. And one of the things that I've learned in having them out here in the full sun is by just simply keeping a saucer under them, it cuts my watering to half. Another interesting thing that I've discovered at the nursery this year, more and more companies are actually growing plants and herbs in these peat pots. And you plant it directly in the soil. They're biodegradable. And what's great about that is that you don't get all these plastic pots stacked up at the end of a long gardening day. And what do you do with them? Well, you throw them away and they end up in the landfill, which is not a great thing for the planet. So by having these biodegradable pots, it helps us be better stewards of the planet. <music> Thank mm -hmm. you.
I'm happy to report that our well house is almost finished. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? As you can see, I followed many of the same styles and used many of the same materials as we did on the main house. You see, this is an important place out here on the farm. It houses a well that produces 60 gallons a minute. From the very beginning, it looked like a miniature version of the house. Its shape and form when it was framed up and wrapped. And then when we put the roof on it, the roof is the same standing seam roof that you see on the barns in the main house. And then the brick. The brick is that wood mold brick that gives it a really old look, even down to the lime wash. And as you can see, the lime wash is about the color of these daffodils. So it all blends so harmoniously. And now the guys are running electricity underground from the well house over to the pond so we can put an electric fence around the pens for the Sebastopol geese and the mute swans. As you know, one of the important aspects of the Garden Home Retreat is to try to preserve resources, no matter what they are, and water is certainly one of them. What we've done here is we've created a rainwater harvesting system that works off the buildings. Not only the house and the two outbuildings, but the barns as well. And we figure on an average year, we're going to be able to harvest about 450,000 gallons of water. Okay, now what's going on behind me, the guys are actually installing the gutters, which are an important part of getting the water off the roof into the cisterns. Now this is no ordinary gutter. It is traditional in that it's a half round gutter, but it's made of turn coated steel, turn coated stainless steel. And what's important about that is that there's no chance of it corroding or rusting which is very good so it won't stain the house and it's going to stay there for a long time. The other is that it's inert, meaning that there'll be no heavy metals in the water that we actually collect. So you could literally drink this water. Now our plan of course is to use it to irrigate the garden and the orchard. You know, it's easy to love this time of year, and it's certainly easy to love tulips. It has to be one of my favorite spring flowers. In this part of the garden, here in the central part, between the cool side and the warm side, we have the neutral center, and I've planted it all out in white tulips, one variety. This variety is called Maureen, and it really is a stunning performer. As you can see in these containers around the pool, we put 75 tulips in each one of those pots, and look what a bouquet we have. And I love the variation in color. You go from green to chartreuse to buttery yellow, and as they mature, they turn pure white. Now the theme in this garden has always been white. It's accented with, as you can see, white pansies and violas, and soon after the tulips fade, we'll start seeing those white roses come into flower. And I love the gray tones of the Poas Castle Artemisia. Now, this is a monochromatic color scheme. If you wanna see lots of colors, you can go to gardens that are certainly larger than mine, where they have plenty of room to display all kinds of tulip varieties and colors. And the quantity, well, over 90,000. Today is the part of the tulip extravaganza here at Garvin Gardens. And we have worked very hard uh, planting 90,000 tulips through the months of December and January and um, they are just now starting to bloom. They have been blooming for about two or three weeks now and they will continue on for about three or four more weeks. When you come to Garden Gardens, you're going to be able to experience an array of colors, shapes, sizes, and they will bloom starting in early March and they're gonna bloom through late April. So you will see early season tulips as well as your mid and late season tulips. Today at Garvin Gardens, if you were to visit, you would see tulips that are blooming for the mid to late season. Some examples of these would be Angelique, which is a peony tulip, which has um, more of a double bloom, similar to the double tulips. You would also see some lily type tulips, such as Pretty Woman or Poker Fanfare. Most of you will be familiar with the Triumph tulip, which is the most common shape of a tulip. It's the very traditional flower, almost egg-shaped. Um, some examples of that are a Mrs. John Sheepers, which is blooming right now. It's a very beautiful yellow single flower. Another type of tulip also is the Darwin tulip, which is very similar to the Triumph tulip. Some examples are the Golden Parade and the Appledorn, which is a beautiful orange tulip. 
The biggest issue you will have with planting tulips is that they are not a perennial bulb in our climate. Um, our summers are just too hot, they usually will rot, and the ones that you will get to survive through the winter will not bloom properly the next year. You might have 60 to 80 percent of your bulbs bloom next year if you do leave them in the ground. Um, another big problem with tulips is that the deer love to eat them. If you want to have a beautiful tulip garden each year, you should probably replant your bulbs. Uh, we have had the best luck with the hybrids, uh, Darwin hybrids. However, you can also purchase a species tulip. These are a little bit smaller blooms, but they will come back for you each and every year. Two examples of species tulips that would come back for you every year are Lilac Wonder and Lady Jane. Both of these are unimproved tulips, so like I said, their blooms are a little bit smaller, but they are very beautiful, and they will come back for you every year. Here at Garvin Gardens this year, we have 63 varieties of tulips. Um, we encourage you to come through and look at each and every one of them. Make a list of the ones that you particularly like. They are readily available in the springtime and in the fall at your local nurseries. Tulips are a very easy plant to grow in your garden. Um, there's so many different colors and varieties to choose from that you can pick the colors that fit your landscape the best and go out and buy them in the fall and plant them in your garden and in the springtime you will have a spectacular show. Wow, just look at all of these strawberry blooms and strawberries, little tiny ones. We're gonna have a bumper crop this year. You know, these plants have been so good as a ground cover here in the vegetable garden. A ground cover that fills this entire bed. And above it, you can see these kefir espaliered pears. Now last year, what we had was these strawberries putting out runners and this entire path was filled with little strawberry plants. All the runners came out and they rooted into the ground. But I didn't want to throw them away. We dug them up in the fall and transplanted them at this end of the garden. So why don't you come on down here and let me show you what we're doing. We took all of those little strawberry plants and we put them in this space under the big fig tree. We have this giant 85 year old fig which is the center point of this garden and I planted them in this 20 foot diameter circle about 8 to 10 inches apart. Now what will happen is they'll produce strawberries this year. You can see the blooms and the little fruit on them but over the course of the summer they'll grow together and by fall they will have spilled out over the edge and hey I'll have the same situation I had last year. Lots of strawberry plants to try to find a home for. I may run out of room, I'll have so many strawberries. But that's what's so great about the garden. She just keeps giving and giving and giving. I love all kinds of animals, I always have. And I particularly love domestic animals. They fit beautifully out here at the Garden Home Retreat. But if you've ever tried to raise domestic animals, you know that often you have to figure out ways to keep them from being poached by predators. And that's certainly the case with many of my waterfowl species we have here. Some of the most elegant are the swans. We have five mute swans, and I felt like before I got them, I really needed to get a system in place to keep predators from getting their eggs. And here in early spring, they're particularly vulnerable because the females are making nests and laying eggs. And so they are vulnerable to bobcats, coyotes, and foxes jumping them and taking them, and then certainly the eggs, and raccoons and possums love those. So what I've created here is a series of corrals that during this period they can be housed comfortably, they can lay their eggs, they can hatch out their little nestlings, and then they can mature to the point we can turn them loose on the pond and there they'll be safe. Now the waterfowl breeds we have out here currently include those curly feathered geese called Sebastiopoles and an adorable little duck which is black and white called a magpie which happens to be a very good layer. And then the most majestic of them all, I suppose, would have to be the mute swans. And this time of year, when they begin to create their nests, well, they can be a little ornery to deal with. Now, don't let their elegant, graceful appearance fool you. They can be fierce defenders of their nests. But you know, even with that said, it's important for me to create a system here that actually protects them. It's important to take care of the things that you have. 
And I also think this certainly applies to wildlife. So it's encouraging to me that we have people such as Karen Rao who are working on behalf of migratory birds. So today was an experiment to take nine-month-old trumpeter swan cygnets, bringing them south in the hopes that they will stay and imprint on this wintering site in the uh, late winter, return back north to Iowa to their natal or their birth territories, remain there through the summer months, and then return back here in the fall to winter again. What we're doing here is restoring a native North American species back to the United States, and families can teach their children by going out and experiencing the opportunity to see these trumpeter swans through the Mississippi Flyway, everywhere from Wisconsin down here through uh, Missouri and Iowa and Arkansas, their families can take their children and teach them about the value of wetlands, the value of having North America's largest waterfowl, and, and kids, when they see this beautiful big white bird, just are in awe of it. The North America's largest bird, the, uh, the trumpeter swan, eight-foot wingspan, 35 pounds. One of the guys say he is a, he is a 42-pound swan on his property. Property. People learn and love the things that they know and see, and teaching children about wildlife comes from letting them experience things such as seeing their first wild trump or swan. Every bird species is, is the piece of the puzzle that makes, when it's fit together, it makes the whole ecosystem, and the healthy ecosystem, we depend on it just like wildlife. And when we have a, a a wetland system that's healthy enough to support swans, then we know it's healthy enough to support us and our children. They'll breed at three or four years of age, so hopefully they'll go back north when they're three and four, breed and bring their young back and thus establish that pattern of migration. Well, I think down the line, the real benefit are our children who will be able to then come out and say, this is a piece of our heritage that we've restored here to Arkansas, that we've restored to the flyway. Wildlife is, is the puzzle piece of the planet, all the different species. And when you take that final piece, that trumpeter swan piece, and you put it in that puzzle, and you have the whole connected again, you're healthy, everything's right with the world. And when you can look at a trumpeter swan and hear him flying over, it's indescribable. It, it means the earth is whole, the earth is good, and all's right with the world. I really enjoy spending time in my design studio. I'm always moving all my junk around in different places. This is the place where we take photographs that you send in to me, and I respond to them. We come up with ways to improve the landscape. Now today, we're looking at Sandra's Garden in Portland, Oregon. It's a charming craftsman-style bungalow, and it looks like the exterior is done in white stucco. Now, there are a few things that I would suggest to help bump up the charm factor, which is exactly what she would like to do. First, I think that there's an opportunity here to remove all of the grass and make this entire space here and here, even out here, I assume that's the curb, garden, and that's what we want to do. The other thing is that you can see that we've got a flower bed from here to here and here to here, and it stops and it's not on center with the house. So as we think about the design of this particular garden, I wanna make sure that we try to create some symmetry. Here's the rail, the post, columns on the front here. So we wanna make sure that we're symmetrical with that line. So let's get started. All right, now to bump up the charm factor, I always like to lean on a classic picket fence and you can create just about any style you like, but it's fun to come up with a motif that fits a craftsman style house. So I would encourage you, Sandra, to look for a craftsman style motif, but what I would do is bring it across to here, and I would bring it across to here, and do some sort of gate, and do it in the craftsman style. Pickets along here. Probably do a nice simple post, simple post here, and bring those pickets all the way down. This doesn't need to be elaborate. Come across like this. Now it could be white, or what might be more interesting would be to let this fence and gate be a really dark chocolate brown. Now I can't tell the color of your door here, but let's just assume that it is a, a really dark chocolate color. You could bring that color out here to the fence, which would make it really interesting. Then another hardscape component that I would add would be here. I would create the width of the sidewalk, whatever that is, let's call it four feet perhaps. 
I would lay some flagstone right here, maybe just a couple of flagstones, and then you can see that we have really centered this up. All right, now let's talk about some of the plants we might want to use here. Not sure what's going on over here on this corner. Um, looks like that it might be well, some sort of evergreen, but what about if we did some kind of a camellia over here? And I would love if there was enough room, it's a little hard to see, but a pair of Yoshino cherries with their pale pink blossoms, one on that side and one over here, would be fantastic. And pull them a little close to the street so the trunk may come to here, to here, because you don't want them getting up into the eave of the house. Let's remove all of the grass and create a path that comes around the side of the house. And I would just do that in little tiny gravels, maybe some flagstone, and use the inside of that as a way to plant, or as a place to plant lots of different kinds of flowers. There are opportunities here, of course, to do some kind of a rose that would grow across the fence here and here, and maybe even one up this column and this column to come across here. Uh, if we went with sort of a peachy salmon color, you could use Colette. Uh, if you wanted to go with a more golden color, you might go for Polka. I grow both of those and love them. And then on the fence, I would either use Colette or Polka. Uh, I wouldn't mix it up too much. Then on the inside, there's a wide range of perennials you can grow. Just think of some of the old classics, iris, phlox, peonies. For summer, you could use purple cone flowers. And then there's just no end to the annuals you could grow. Um, for instance, this whole bed along here, I would take out this deciduous material here and here and make all of this flower bed. I would do a pair of boxwoods or evergreens here on each side to mark it. And then let this just be all low annuals. And here's where you could really have a lot of fun through the growing season. You might do a whole range of purples like that wonderful uh, royal velvet purple petunia. You might use a beautiful blue sage. There are many of those to choose from. Artemisia for silver tones. And just think about all of these flowers being in the cool range and then these warm colored roses up against this white stucco. We've got a real charmer here, Sandra. And I hope these ideas help you out. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, those swans certainly are beautiful, but gosh, just look at these tulips. You could call tulips the swans of the flower world. Well, I hope you've been inspired to plant lots of beautiful things around your garden home. Until next time, from the garden home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.